All right. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Yeah, okay. It seems yep. to be working. Fantastic. Um, okay, so today we're going to continue talking about pericyclic reactions. And uh, the only subgroup of reactions that we're going to focus on today are the cycloaddition reactions. So that's the first category that we had in our list um, that we made during uh, last lecture. So cyclo addition uh, reactions. And we looked at a couple of examples um, uh, of these reactions previously. And something that we haven't discussed yet is how these reactions actually proceed. So it turns out that you can run these reactions under thermal control, so basically by just heating the reagents together, or you can run them under photochemical conditions. So thermal or photochemical. And the last one, photochemical, essentially means that you need, you will need light in order to make this um, reaction work. So let's start looking at one that runs under, under this thermal um, control first. And um, it's essentially the, the prototypical diels alder reaction where you have a simple diene and you react this with a dienophile. So again, this is the classical four pi electron system we're reacting with the um, with the two pi electron system, file, and um, if you um, if you heat these up together in a reaction flask, they go through one transition state, and usually we draw these transition states in brackets, so you can think about this a little bit like like this. And in this transition state, essentially, these electrons, um, these six electrons are shared between both of these molecules. So there's essentially six pi electrons here. And uh, this gives us the product uh, that we have seen of Diels Alder reactions before, which is simply uh, the cyclohexene here. So in this transition state, what is characteristic for this transition state is that it has six pi electrons here. And they are distributed um, around the entire ring that you're forming here, right? And you can think about this a little bit as kind of an aromatic type transition state. Right? This is not entirely correct because some of these are more in sigma orbitals than in, in pi bonds. But uh, if we just go by the number of electrons that we're dealing with here, this fulfills the aromaticity rule of uh, 4n plus 2. So we call this usually an aromatic transition state. And it turns out that these reactions uh, proceed well under conditions where you just um, where you just do these reactions under, under thermal control. So just heat is enough uh, to make these, um, these reactions work. Now, um, just to give you the opposite example of kind of a more photochemical pathway, um, if you tried a reaction, a cycloaddition between, for example, an, uh, a simple olefin, and you paired this up with just another olefin, so in, I, all I did was basically switch the diene out here for just an, uh, another alkene. And I try to do this reaction here under thermal conditions again. What I'm going to be uh, expecting in the transition state again is something that is sharing all the electrons that are participating in the pi system between these two fragments. This is our transition state again. And if you count the electrons here, we are dealing with four pi electrons here. So four pi electrons, right? And um, the product, as we had expected, is just basically cyclo, um, um, cyclobutane. Now it turns out that the electron count in this transition state here uh, obeys the 4n pi electron rule. So that's what we usually call an anti-aromatic transition state. Anti-aromatic um, transition state. And it turns out that these reactions that go through an anti-aromatic transition state do not work just under thermal conditions. So you cannot perform this reaction by just heating these two components 
um, with each other. So in order to make these work, you actually have to expose them to light. So you have to irradiate the reaction and the energy that comes from the photon um, allows this reaction um, to proceed. Now, there is some terminology um, that we use uh, in, uh, in, in these cases. And what we usually say is that reactions are thermally allowed or thermally forbidden. So in this case, we look at this reaction, the Diels Older reaction up here. We know that it goes through an aromatic transition state with six pi electrons. And if we just heat this up, we can expect to see the product. So we call this usually thermally allowed. So nomenclature here, thermally allowed reaction. And analogous down here, um, if we just heated this up, we would not expect to see any product. And I'll explain in uh, just a little bit why that is. But these are the thermally forbidden, forbidden reactions. And these are characterized by an anti-aromatic um, uh, transition state. Right. Okay, so let's dive a little bit deeper into this mystery of why some of these reactions appear to be allowed uh, just by heating and some of them actually require additional encouragement through, um, through light. So we'll start with these ones up here because that's kind of like the simplest, um, simplest model system um, that we can analyze in order to understand this principle why some of these are thermally allowed or others are thermally forbidden, we need to look at the orbitals that are actually participating and forming the bonds, the new bonds between the diene and, uh, and the dienophile. So in order to do that, the best way to, um, to, to do this analysis is to draw basically an orbital uh, diagram. So we can try to draw uh, an energy scale here. So this is basically just uh, a delta um, in the energy. And um, we can draw in here our molecular orbitals for um, the diene. So let's say um, this side here is going to be the diene. And on this side, um, we're going to draw uh, the dienophile. So we know that we have here four p orbitals that are participating um, in this process. And over here, we have uh, two p orbitals, right? So we can draw the, um, the, the wave functions that correspond to the linear combination of these four orbitals um, into this diagram now. Now, the lowest um, um, orbital phi one would be the one where basically all the um all the orbitals are essentially in phase so if we use this shading um uh, uh, shading method all of them basically have the dark lobe or the shaded lobe on the same side and this is um our phi one orbital right the next higher one is going to have a node here uh, in the middle so the next higher one if we draw this out is going to be looking a little bit like this. This is going to be phi two. Um, as we go up this, uh, this ladder in energy, the next one is going to have two nodes. So we can draw our two nodes here. So the first one is between these two orbitals and the second one is between the third one and the fourth. So this is phi three. And then the last one is the one that is going to be completely alternating. So I have a node between each of these, um, each of these orbitals. So this is phi four. And I can um, assign an energy level to each of these orbitals. And uh, we can think about this in a second, like how these orbitals are actually occupied. Now, on the other side, uh, just to, to complete the analysis, we have to look at the two orbitals um, of the dienophile of this olefin right now. And they are roughly um, come about um, roughly here. And if we look at how these orbitals look like, it's just a linear combination of two orbitals. Right. So you have the highest occupied molecular orbital that looks like this and the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital that basically has one node here between these two, right? Um, 
Okay. So um, now the the way we look at these now, um, so it would be that the first thing that we need to do is essentially figure out which of these orbitals are going to end up being occupied? Which of these orbitals actually have electrons in there? And we just follow basically the, the build-up principle. We know that we have four electrons um, on this side of the, of the diene, and we can just fill them in from the bottom up. So these are basically going to be the two filled orbitals, and uh, the higher upper ones are going to be the empty ones. And on this side, we have two electrons, so we do the same thing on this side we have two electrons here. So that allows us then to determine that essentially this one here is, uh, is the highest occupied molecular orbital of the dienophile. And this is the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital um, of the dienophile. On the other side, uh, we can do the same analysis. So basically here, phi two would be our homo, and phi three would be our numo, right? Now, whenever we want to form uh, linear combinations between these, and this is essentially what we're doing when we are building, um, when we are forming essentially a new bond, um, we basically always have to uh, combine a filled orbital with an empty orbital in order to get, um, uh, to get a new bond out of this, right? And we have two combinations that we could apply here now. So let me just pick quickly a different color. Maybe this one here. Um, so we could either take uh, the highest occupied molecular orbital of the, um, of the diene and form a linear combination with the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital of the dienophile. So basically, I'm going to take these two orbitals and, and form a bond with them. And I'm just going to call this now, for the sake of this discussion, the alternative A. Right? Or I could have come around and say, like, well, I'm going to form a bond between the LUMO of the diene and the highest occupied molecular orbital of the dienophile. And this would, in our discussion here, now be um, essentially a case of scenario, um, scenario B, right? Now, now this, is, this is kind of the, the, the way we can analyze these now by looking at the combination of orbitals of, for example, the HOMO of the diene and the LUMO of the dienophile or the LUMO of the diene and the HOMO of the dienophile. So these are the two combinations, A and B, uh, that we're gonna look a little bit closer at right now. Now, I'm gonna pull up another piece of paper here to be able to extend this a little bit. I hope this stays in, in focus. Yeah, so, okay. All right, let's do it this way. Okay, so um, we're gonna look at our combination A first. So let's say, um, a is basically the first one uh, that we want to take a closer look at, and that rep is represented by the combination of the highest occupied molecular orbital of the diene and the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital of uh, the dienophile. Now, I can draw this out just, um, just to make this a little bit more, um, more visual. Um, I can draw these pi systems actually out in a form that they come together in the um, in the reaction, let's draw it. Let's draw it like this, um, like this. And now we basically can just translate the the shading that we had uh, in this system from here. So we can say like, okay, we have um, one node in the dienophile, and uh, in the diene we basically also have one node in in the middle of the system, right? So we can draw shade it down here, and shade it up here. Right? And uh, what you can clearly see now already is that the lobes that have the same shading now come close together and can overlap. So you have an unshaded lobe here that can overlap with an unshaded lobe on this side, and you have a shaded lobe that can overlap with a shaded lobe um, on, on that side. I can also draw this a little bit more in perspective um, to illustrate like actually what the geometry between these is when they come together. So it looks a little bit more like this. So we have the one lobe and then um, shaded, shaded, and then like this. And you see that in this case, actually these lobes can come very close to each other 
and they can form uh, the new um, sigma bond. There's somebody still in the chat um, who is not muted. Can you please make sure that you mute yourself? I hear a lot of background noise. Thanks. Okay. So this is, the, this is the scenario A, basically, where we took the highest occupied molecular orbital of the diene and the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital um, of the dienophile. Now we could go ahead and basically do the same thing for the scenario B, and this is what I'm gonna draw down here. So um, scenario B, where we basically just took uh, the opposite combination. We're gonna take the LUMO of the diene and the highest occupied molecular orbital of the dienophile. So again, we can draw this out like this. We have our P orbitals. And then we have the dienophile down here. And we know that these are shaded on the same side. And so this was our, um, our HOMO combination. So this is HOMO. Um, and then the LUMO combination here, we can just basically copy from up here. Still in, still in the window, okay. Um, so it's shaded on the bottom, shaded on the top shaded on the top and shaded on the bottom. So this was our LUMO here. And again, you see that in this combination, in the combination B, we again can successfully find um, an overlap between the ends of the pi systems that are um, shaded exactly the same way. And if we were to draw this in perspective again, we would have something that looks a bit like this. So this lobe comes close to this one and this lobe comes close to this one. So again, that's basically the same, um, the same analysis that we had for the scenario A. It's just that in scenario A, we had the opposite combination where we used the HOMO here and we used the LUMO of the uh, dienophile. Now, what is characteristic for, uh, for these thermal reactions is that they are giving you, all, no matter how you pick this combination, you always are going to receive a favorable interaction between equally shaded lobes um, if they proceed under, under thermal control. Right um, now, the exact combination, which one of these two possible linear combinations A or B is going to be the dominant one uh, in your in your reaction? That is something that we will discuss later, either at the end of this class um, or at the beginning um, of uh, of next class. Um, but we're going to go into uh, into a little bit more detail uh, about this at a later stage. Now, this was one example for a reaction that we know works under, um, under thermal control. So it's worthwhile kind of thinking in direct comparison, how does this work now for reactions that are thermally forbidden? So this was a thermally allowed one. So you can write here, thermally allowed reaction. And that means that we have a favorable Homo LUMO overlap, right? And what I mean by that is basically that we always have uh, the same combination of lobes, either all shaded or um, um, uh, unshaded lobes interacting here and the other side we have, um, we have shaded lobes. So they match essentially in their, in their phases. Um, if you if you could describe it like that. Okay, so this was a thermally allowed reaction. Now let's shift over to a thermally forbidden reaction. And the scenario here is, um, is pretty similar, or the analysis that we can make here is pretty similar. We can start out again with an energy diagram. So let's see. It can be a little bit simpler this time. Um, because we only have to, uh, to talk about essentially our scenario where we take two olefins. We know that there's two p orbitals here and there's two p orbitals over here. We know already how these lobes look like. So um, on this side, we can basically just draw 
the same scenario that we had previously is the highest occupied molecular orbital. And then the one with one node is uh, the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital. So, and we know that um, there were two electrons in this orbital and we can characterize this as the HOMO and this as the LUMO. So this side basically of our diagram stays exactly the same. On the other side, we basically can just copy this over because this should look exactly the same on this side um, if it's exactly the same compound. So we can have our two lobes here again and then the same energy roughly we can draw these two. And again, we have two orbitals here. The lower one is the filled one. And we can again describe them here as, let's say, homo. And we can say lumo for this one. Again, so if we want to form a linear combination between these two, we have to combine a filled orbital uh, with an empty orbital, right? So in this case, for example, I could decide to take the highest occupied molecular orbital on the left and react and react it with the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital on the right. And let's call this the combination, let's call this A. And uh, I could also have gone around and say like, okay, um, I just do the other way around and uh, I could call this B, but I hope you very quickly realize by now that uh, the combination A, since these two fragments are identical, is, is essentially exactly the same as the combination B that I, that I drew here. So whether I take this HOMO and react it with this LUMO, or whether I take this HOMO and react it with this LUMO is essentially the same, um, the same system, right? So that leads us essentially to the, to the next step um, where we have to look at how these orbitals um, come together. So let's, let's draw it in maybe B, and we can say A is equal to B in this case. All right, so how does this look like when we bring these two together? Well, we can draw our, um, our, um, our orbitals. Let's say we have one here, and we bring the other one just down below so that the p orbitals can overlap. And we say that one of them is the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital. So we call this the, the LUMO. So this would be this one, for example. And uh, the other one is going to be the HOMO. And we know that the shading of the HOMO looks like this. And now um, when, you're, when you're asked to basically uh, overlap these lobes, you quickly see that on one side, uh, the system works out just fine, right? Uh, you don't have to worry about this. On the other side, you quickly realize that you have to overlap a shaded lobe with an unshaded lobe. And that basically is not a bonding interaction. That's actually anti-bonding, right? So we can draw here, anti-bonding interaction. So that means on one side of this pi system, you might be forming a sigma bond, but on the other side, you can't form a, a bond at the same time. So because of the symmetry of these wave functions, these reactions are thermally forbidden, at least when you try to do a combination between the HOMO and the LUMO. So these reactions um, um, are uh, thermally forbidden or symmetry of the wave function um, prohibits favorable overlap between the HOMO and LUMO because there is like an opposite shading uh, on this side. And that's why these reactions, we usually call them um, thermally um, forbidden. Now, um, there's a caveat to that. So you can actually tweak the system to, to still make this work, 
And um, for some reason, I basically arbitrarily decided that I'm going to bring these two molecules together in the way that I described here, where basically um, the top part of the molecule, basically uh, one, one, one sits essentially directly above, um, above the other one. But there is no real reason why, um, why these two molecules should, why this should be the only possible orientation that these two molecules could come together. So there is an alternative actually, For, uh, for, this, uh, for, for describing this reaction. We're just gonna go over this in, um, in just a quick, um, a quick second. Um, and I could have rearranged them in any form that I wanted to just to create this favorable overlap. And one form that actually works um, favorably is if I take um, one component and I put it um, Perpen uh, so uh, perpendicular essentially, so that uh, the uh, the lobes essentially point outwards towards me. So the p orbitals now come out of the plane of the um, um, of the paper. So this would be basically our highest occupied molecular orbital now. So we can write here homo. And then if I, um, if I brought in the, the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital, so this one here perpendicular to that. So if I brought this in, for example, if I drew this um, just like this in front of it, and I have to twist it a little bit in order to make this work. So now uh, the pi system is essentially in the plane um, of, of the paper. And uh, if we draw this out, then uh, we can say like, okay, this is the, lowest unoccupied molecular orbital, it has a node, and this would be our um, LUMO in this case scenario. Now, if you take a closer look at this, now if instead of basically just pushing these into each other, I start rotating uh, them into each other, so I basically take this one and twist it, so basically take this and start twisting it this way, you quickly can see that uh, you can form a favorable overlap between um, uh, the, the shaded lobes in this scenario. So in this, in, in this case, if you bring them together like this, there's actually a possibility um, to create a favorable overlap. Now, there is, however, a caveat to this, because these are not just uh, p orbitals, but they essentially have hydrogens or any other substituents um, attached to these carbon atoms, right? And if you bring them together like this, you essentially have to force these hydrogens um, into, uh, into the pi system. So there's a steric, uh, um, steric demand, especially between uh, these hydrogens here that are here pointing towards the back that you push essentially into this other, um, into this other molecule. So sterics of this system essentially raise the energy um, for this possible um, linear combination. So we can write here next to it, um, thermally possible And there's some few uh, examples where, uh, where a combination like that actually works. We'll talk about this um, later, um, but requires a lot of heat to bring these together because you have to squeeze these, uh, these hydrogens essentially into the other molecule. Now, what is the problem with that? Well, if we start heating this up, we run into a little bit of trouble with the energetics of this reaction. Because remember, when we describe these reactions, we say like the Gibbs free energy delta G is equals to delta H minus T delta S, right? And um, the problem here is that uh, this T delta S term here um, under elevated temperatures starts to dominate. And uh, we, we are, of course, having an unfavorable entropic um, contribution to the system because we're making one molecule out of two molecules. So this term here basically um, is penalizing you as you raise the temperature. So um, uh, dominates at high temperatures 
And that essentially leads to the observation that uh, even if you are able to bring this together, um, the reverse reaction, so the dissociation, essentially the, the, the reverse reaction of the cycloaddition is favored in this case for entropic reasons. So um, reverse reaction is favored due to entropy. Right, so there is a very a couple of few examples where this reaction, where you can get this reaction to work as a two plus two thermal cycloaddition, and we will we'll treat these later as as exceptions to the system. But um, the the key takeaway I think from this um, from this analysis is that anytime you try to do like a um, an approach that looks very much like the approach we talked for the deals all the reaction. Um, you come to an unfavorable overlap here. If you tweak the approach, you come to an approach that is basically penalized by the sterics of the system and it favors uh, the reverse um, reaction. So overall, these, these types of reactions that go to, through an anti-aromatic transition state that follows the 4 uh, n pi electron rule are thermally forbidden. That's how we usually, um, how we usually treat them. Now, what I mentioned a little bit earlier is that despite these reactions being thermally forbidden, we still can make them work if we just give them a little bit of a jolt with light. And uh, this is how we, how we get to the, um, to the next um, subsection, uh, the reaction under photochemical uh, condition. So um, two plus two under photochemical control. All right, so this changes our energy diagram a tiny little bit because now we have to consider that um, we have uh, an electron uh, that is in, in, or a molecule that is in the, in the first excited state. So let's look at this a little bit. So one side of this diagram we can still keep normal. So this basically was our double bond. And we can say, um, well, uh, let's say, we have our two orbitals again. We have the HOMO and the LUMO. And LUMO over here, and let's include the shading. And in the ground state, um, the system is going to be um, uh, in, its, in its electronic ground state. So there's two electrons in uh, the highest occupied uh, molecular orbital. Now, what happens if I introduce a photon to the system? What happens if I excite this um, with light? Um, well, what I get out of this is going to be essentially an excited molecule. So uh, you can usually depict that as kind of a pi um, with a star next to it. And uh, the orbitals in the excited molecule stay exactly the same. It's just that the electron distribution in the system changes a little bit. So again, you have this orbital and you have this orbital and they're associated energy levels. Just that this time, what happens is that the, when the light gets absorbed in the molecule, one of these electrons gets promoted uh, to the LUMO. So in this case, you have something that looks like this. And you essentially have created uh, two single occupied um, molecular orbitals. And it happens to be that this one here now is the orbital that has um, the, uh, the, the highest uh, highest partially occupied um, molecular orbital. Usually we call this the SOMO, single occupied molecular orbital, SOMO. Okay. Um, now this is basically what happens when you shine light on these molecules and uh, they promote essentially one of the electrons from the ground state uh, to the next higher orbital. And now we can think about what happens if you form a linear combination between that and basically just the normal ground state um, uh, olefin that we have on this side. So let's say 
we can draw our ground state here again. It's the same orbitals. Um, let's draw it like this. And we have the ground state. And we have, again, the HOMO and uh, the LUMO in this case. Now, again, the rules are the same. You have to basically form a linear combination between an empty orbital and an orbital that contains uh, an electron. And um, in, the, in the excited state now, what you're going to do is you're going to form a linear combination between these two. So this is your empty orbital, your LUMO of the ground state, and your SOMO of the first, um, first excited state. So that's basically the, the, the linear combination of orbitals that you're going to look at in, um, in, in, in this scenario. Now, how do these orbitals, um, how does the picture of orbitals now look if they start interacting? Well, we can draw out again the exact same diagram that we had previously. So we have the two pi systems and we bring them together again in the same way as we discussed previously, where they basically just stack one on top um, um, the other, and we can fill them in again. So let's say the, yeah, let's put the bottom one here as the LUMO. So this is going to be your lowest unoccupied molecular orbital. And uh, the other one on the other side is now this orbital here. And if we just turn this around, it still has a node. So if we draw it like this, this is going to be your SOMO now. And if you look closely at this, if you bring them together, one of them in the excited state and the other one in the ground state, what you'll see is that the, the orbital overlap on both sides or both ends of the pi system looks perfect. So they are exactly the same shading um, on this side of the pi system and on this side of the pi system. So this is going to form a bonding interaction between these two lobes and this is going to form a bonding interaction between these two lobe, slopes. So, so what this um, what this photochemical activation essentially did is that it changes the symmetry of one of the orbitals that are interacting and forms or allows now to form a favorable bonding interaction at both ends of the pi system. So the light changes, changes the symmetry of the interacting orbitals. And this essentially leads to a favorable interaction of the pi systems. Now, all of this was basically um, uh, a lengthy way uh, to, to explain to you why some of these reactions proceed under thermal control and why some other reactions, um, like these ones here, for example, proceed under photochemical um, reaction control. Uh, the nice thing is that Anytime you analyze something like this, you don't always have to go back to the in-depth orbital analysis that we have done here. I mean, this, this builds the foundation for it, um, but uh, you can derive much simpler rules essentially to predict whether a reaction is going to proceed under thermal control or whether it's going to proceed under photochemical control. And those are kind of like the rules that we want to summarize right now in just a, just a small little table. And we can say here, um, let's say for all cycloadditions The rules that you have to obey just depend on the number of pi electrons um, that you have uh, in the system. So you can make a table here and you can say like the number of pi electrons Uh, and you can plot this against uh, either the allowed or uh, forbidden uh, forbidden rule. So um, how should we put this? Um, um, yeah, let's say allowed. Um, 
And uh, we can populate this table now. We know that um, any system that has an aromatic transition state, so where we have 4n um, plus 2 pi electrons, uh, we know that this is allowed under thermal control. So thermal control. So that means that you have both molecules in the ground state uh, reacting with each other. If you have uh, 4n electrons, and this is the anti-aromatic system, so we can write here aromatic and anti-aromatic. Then this reaction is uh, allowed under photochemical control. And the nice thing is that these are mutually um, exclusive. So something that is allowed uh, under thermal control um, is forbidden under photochemical control, right? So um, uh, a 4n plus 2 reaction, for example, will not proceed uh, with light. A 4n reaction will not proceed um, with, uh, with just heat, right? So 4n plus 2 is always thermal and 4N is always um, a photochemical reaction. And they're mutually, um, mutually exclusive um, in, in this way. So that's basically the simplified rules uh, that, you can, uh, that you can easily memorize. Uh, if it's an aromatic transition state, you, you do it as a thermal reaction. If it's an anti-aromatic transition state, you do it um, as, a, uh, as a photochemical reaction. Now let's look, look a little bit closer at the, at the Diels Alder reaction specifically. And this now basically talks only about this type, um, uh, this type of reaction here. So 4n plus 2, the typical reaction here is the Diels Alder reaction that we're going to look a little bit closer now. So this, you'll find this in your book uh, in, in chapter 24. And, and this is the Diels Alder reaction. Now, we already know that based on the rules, it's an aromatic transition state. So it follows the rules of the 4N um, plus 2 reaction. So we can say that it's thermally allowed, right? That's what we learned already. Okay. And um, now, what we want to look at a little bit closer are now the details of, um, of this, uh, uh, of the specific uh, reaction, the Diels Alder reaction, and how substituents, for example, um, affect this. And one key thing that we have to have to consider for this is, um, is the diene conformation. So diene conformation. And remember, when we looked at the orbital diagrams, I arbitrarily basically placed um, these, uh, uh, the diene in, a, uh, in an S cis conformation. So if you think about this, um, I said that the diene was going to be adopting this conformation, even though I, I well know that it is in equilibrium with the S trans. So this is S cis. Um, in the S trans conformation that looks like this. And um, of course, the S trans conformation uh, is favored in this scenario by, uh, by a significant extent. So this is basically uh, at any point in time, only about 2% are in the S cis conformation and about 98% are in the S trans conformation. And that just has to do with the fact that the hydrogen substituents that are at this position get into each other's way when they are in the, in the S cis conformation. So that's basically just sterics between, uh, between these two groups um, that, that favor uh, the, uh, the S trans conformation. However, in order to do the reaction, only uh, molecules that are in this conformation here can perform um, a successful uh, thermal diels alder reaction. So um, only this conformation 
reacts in the Diels Alder reaction. And this is because this is the only confirmation where these two ends of the pi system come close enough to each other that they can form their sigma bonds to the dienophile. In this S trans confirmation, the distance between this atom here and this atom here is too far for them to bridge essentially the, uh, the, the dienophile. Now, you can ask, is this going to be a problem? Well, yes, it is going to be a problem because you only have a very small amount of your molecule in the right conformation. So the re you can expect that this reaction is going to be slow or sluggish. It's going to still give you the product because this is an equilibrium, right? So you constantly keep reforming the 2% of the S-cis conformation as this keeps reacting away in the Diels Older reaction. This is constantly replenished from this unreactive reservoir of the S-trans conformation. However, um, the, it, this, uh, this analysis allows you to give some predictions over um, the, the relative rate of some of these reagents. So if we look, for example, um, at simple um, butadiene in, and we compare the rate of the reaction, so the K relative here, and I'm just going to call this for calibration, let's say this is a, a rate of one. If we make sure that um, these, uh, this conformation here is favored or is locked into place, we can increase the rate of the reaction. So one classical way of doing this is locking these double bonds um, with, uh, with um, cyclic structures. So in this case, for example, this um, cyclically locked S-cystine reacts about 10 times faster than, uh, than the um, simple butadiene. And that's basically just because it cannot adopt the S-trans um, conformation. The other thing that accelerates the reaction is if you bring these two ends of the pi system closer to each other, right? So the closer you bring these uh, together, the more favorable uh, the reaction is going to be. And that is illustrated by basically taking, for example, a five-membered ring and integrating the double bonds within the five-membered ring. So now these two ends are tied together by this methylene here, and they can no longer rotate around this bond to form the S-trans conformation. And that kind of locks the system into a highly reactive form. And this is about, if you compare it with the, with the naked um, butadiene, this is about 1,350 times faster um, reacting than, um, than the diene. So you'll see in most deals, all the reactions um, do not um, proceed easily with systems like this one. Most examples you will see uh, chemists use tricks like locking this into, um, into some, um, some ring structure to increase the reactivity and, uh, and the rate of the reaction. But please remember, it's not impossible to make this react, but uh, you'll maybe have to wait a long time or use, um, use higher pressures um, to make this um, reaction work. Now, um, as maybe a little bit of an exercise, I can give you some examples and you can try to figure out um, um, uh, these uh, at home. So this is just a quick exercise. Um, the question here is um, um, order these molecules uh, according to their rate of reaction. So order um, according to rate of reaction. So let's say you have four different species Let's say something like this. Um, let's say you have something like this. Uh, let's say you have something like this. And the last one, where you have a system like this. So you could think about this uh, based on the analysis that we have just made previously and uh, try to order these, um, these four structures 
according uh, to their reactivity. Uh, some of these might not react at all, and some of these might react significantly faster um, than, uh, than the other isomers of them. Okay, all right, so um, with this, this first discussion um, about the, um, the geometry of the daim uh, behind us, what we want to look at a little bit closer is the thermodynamics of the diels alder reaction. So thermodynamics. of Diels older reaction. And as part of this analysis, we want to have a closer look at, again, the, the classical picture of the reaction of a diene with a, with a dienophile and how we would go about analyzing um, the, the thermodynamics of the system. So here we basically have um, a system of a diene and a dienophile, and as a total in the system, uh, we can count three pi bonds uh, that um, that we that we um, have react with each other. Now, after the diels alder reaction, um, what we're looking at is essentially um, the cyclic structure that now has two sigma bonds. These are these two new bonds that we have formed over here, and it has one pi bond, right? And if we measure uh, the delta G for this specific reaction, so if we write delta G here, um, delta G naught for this reaction, we can determine this based on this K equilibrium here um, for this reaction. Uh, we get out about something that is um, about minus uh, 27 um, kilocal per mole. And that gives us roughly um, a K equilibrium of about 3.5 um, times 10 to the 19. Right, so it's a it's a it's a pretty um, uh, exothermal reaction uh, that we are looking at here, taking like three pi bonds and forming the cyclic structure that goes downhill uh, quite um, quite a bit. And we can look at this a little bit closer, even if we say um, if we if we look at a specific temperature, for example, at uh, twenty five degrees Celsius, for example, um, the delta G. Um, can be described again as this uh, delta H minus uh, T delta S. And we can distribute these, uh, these minus, minus 27 kilocalories a little bit between these two, uh, these two components. And if you look a little bit closer, that um, then basically this uh, delta H here is the dominating factor here. This is about minus 40 kilocalories per mole. And this T delta S here is negative, um, so it's unfavorable. It, uh, it decreases the entropy because you, you turn two molecules essentially in one. That means that you lose a lot of degrees of freedom here. And this is basically um, minus uh, 13 kilocalories um, per mole. And if you do minus 40, minus minus 13, that gives you like these minus um, 27 kilocalories per mole. Now, what that allows us to, to say about this reaction also is that there is a strong temperature dependence on this reaction. So if you imagine that you keep increasing the temperature for this system, at some point, this term here in the back, this T delta S, as you increase the temperature will become greater and greater. And there's some point where it will basically be larger than this delta H um, that, uh, that you have for the, for the enthalpy of the reaction. And at that stage, essentially, this equilibrium will shift and favor uh, the starting material. So that's what I was talking about when I was saying that all of these reactions are reversible depending on the reaction conditions. So if we keep increasing the temperature, the entropic penalty becomes greater and greater, and it will at some point favor the formation of the starting material over the formation 
of, um, of the products. So um, you can say um, at high temperature, um, the delta G term is dominated by uh, T delta S, and that might invert uh, the position um, of this equilibrium. Now, just to give you an example of, um, of where this comes into play, let's look at one, um, one typical reaction. And that's essentially the, the reaction between um, cyclobutadiene So two, two equivalents of cyclobutadiene, um, if you react them together, let's draw it like this. So one of them is going to react as the uh, diene and the other one is going to react as uh, the dienophile. So if you look at this equilibrium reaction, then uh, the product is a bicyclic compound Um, let's draw this out here, and then we have hydrogens pointing upwards. We have something like this, and a double bond over here. So it turns out that um, if you uh, if you buy um, cyclopentadiene. Uh, and it gets shipped to you in a bottle, what you see is um, that you receive a solid, a whitish, pale white solid, um, that actually, if you inject it into a mass spec, does not come out as, um, as this cyclopentadiene, but what you actually have shipped is the dimer of this already. So the reaction at room temperature favors uh, basically the, the, the dimerization product, the dicyclopentadiene. So dicyclo penta diene. So um, if you think like at let's say twenty five degrees Celsius, um, the delta H of this reaction is uh, minus eighteen kilocal per mole, and uh, the T delta S of this reaction is minus 14 kilocal per mole. So um, in this scenario, they are much, much closer together than in the previous case. Remember previously it was minus 40 and um, minus 13. Uh, in this case, they are basically on the same, uh, on the same, um, uh, on the same scale, right? So, um, the effect here is significantly more pronounced that at room temperature, um, this equilibrium is favored. So let's say delta G not reaction at room temperature is actually the difference between these two. So this is minus four kilocal per mole. And that means that if you start heating this up, you don't have to go very high to basically make this term here greater than the delta H and the, the position of the equilibrium shifts towards the starting material. That means that um, at higher temperature, um, temperature delta T, oh sorry, T, T delta S is greater than minus 18 kilocal per mole, and that shifts the equilibrium towards your starting materials. So if you ever are um, asked to do a Diels Older reaction with cyclopentadiene, what you actually need to do is take your dicyclopentadiene that you get in a bottle and you have to distill it. And during the distillation process, you reach the temperature where this equilibrium shifts in the opposite direction. And what you distill out of your reaction is basically the uh, cyclopentadiene. And you have 
have to use it immediately because if you let it sit around uh, at room temperature, it will dimerize again and give you um, the starting material. So this, this arrow here is basically cracking at high temperature. Right? Okay, let's check the time. I think it's a good point to stop here. Um, the next lecture on Tuesday, we're going to be talking about substituent effects in the Diels Alder reaction, and we'll come back to some of this orbital analysis um, that we have done today, uh, where we basically try to form a linear combination between the highest occupied molecular orbital and the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital. But this time we are gonna have a second look at this and, uh, and see the effect of these linear combinations on the selectivity of the Diels-Alder reaction. So the relative orientation of the diene and uh, the dienophile with respect to each other and what uh, regioisomers we can essentially access um, through this transformation. All right, so um, yeah, let's stop here for today. I'll see you all again uh, next Tuesday. I will post uh, the problem set, um, the, the last problem set later today, um, and uh, we'll give you, I think we said, um, I have, don't have the date here when it's due, but I will post that um, with, uh, with the rest of the notes. Okay, I'll see you all next Tuesday. <laughs>